Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. This is a makeup lecture for we missed Turkey Day and we're way behind so we need to start making some of these lectures up. This is GIGU. There'll be a Thursday AM lecture. Look for it on Brightspace if you want to follow along with the PowerPoint presentation. And I apologize in advance. I have, I'm still fighting that cold. I'm doing a lot better, but I'm still coughing a little bit. So uh, I apologize in advance. Here we go. Pathology of the intestine, specifically we're going to talk about intestinal obstruction or small bowel obstruction. We're not talking about uh, obstruction of the colon, just the small bowel. <clears throat> uh, small bowel obstruction is the same as saying intestinal obstruction. At what is it? Remember the intestine, of course, is a hollow tube what, where your uh, the food that you eat is, tr is turned into kind of a mush type material called chyme. It is pushed into your intestine. All the nutrients are sucked out. The water sunk, sucked out of it. It ultimately comes out of your rectum as fecal material. So that tube um, is important. The size of the tube, the lumen of the tube is important because it needs to be big so you can push that future fecal material through it. If something blocks the size of that tube, then you have yourself an intestinal obstruction. And a new word perhaps for you here is arboral motion, aberral motion. That's downstream motion. Remember what moves, here's a question, what moves the fecal material through the intestinal tube? Peristalsis, very good, peristalsis. Okay. <clears throat> There are two main causes of intestinal obstruction. Mechanical, which is by far the biggest category. And then we have functional or non-mechanical obstruction. We'll look at both of these, mostly mechanical obstruction. Mechanical means that something has reduced the size of the lumen. Functional basically means that the lumen is okay, but peristalsis is broken. Okay, let's look at the type. By far the most common type of mechanical obstruction is called intest is caused from intestinal adhesions. Uh, these aren't inside the intestine, but we'll, we'll look at this specifically in a little while. Uh, but scar tissue can develop between adjacent intestines, usually following surgery, and they can cause the intestines to get tangled up upon one another. And that can, the tangling up of the intestines can, remember they're from anatomy, they're very soft. Uh, so they can get compressed quite easily and then you have yourself a mechanical obstruction. Intestinal hernias, where you can get, just like you get a hernia uh, of the, we talked about hiatal hernias already, you can get one of those through the wall of the intestine. That can cause it, fortunately a bad one, intestinal carcinoma can occur. There's a bunch of other causes as well. We'll look at in a second. Well, I guess the second is here. Let's look at those other causes. Uh, a common one of the other causes is something called intussusception. Intussusception. And that uh, occurs when the proximal piece of small bowel, for, for some crazy reason, it herniates or telescopes into the adjacent downstream intestine. I have a picture in a second. Volvulus is another uh, another cause. This occurs when intestines get tangled up upon themselves. There's no scar tissue involved. There's no adhesions. But sometimes the mesentery, which anchors the intestines to the posterior abdominal wall, sometimes that can get loose or it can be too long and allows intestines to float around too much and they can tangle um, that way. Um, let's see, typically caused by adhesions. I guess it could be caused by adhesions as well. That would still, I guess it would be called a, a, a volvula still. Uh, I'm not sure if I should, probably shouldn't have that in there because it could be uh, all by itself. Adhesions is a different, a different cause uh, and volvulus can be a cause without adhesion, so uh, be careful of, of that. 
So here's an intussusception where the distal ilium has pushed right into the cecum and it's telescoping in the ascending colon. Uh, this can happen anywhere in the small bowel. It likes to happen here. Okay, there's the normal setup, of course. There's the distal ilium coming in. Uh, here's the appendix. The cecum is here. For whatever reason, we'll talk about that more specifically, but this telescopes in. That's called the intussusception. The lead point is right here. That's the point where the telescoping occurs. Make sure you know that. That's the lead point. Uh, the in, intussusception is the one that's doing the telescoping. The intussusception is the one that's receiving uh, the upstream piece of intestine. Okay, here's a volvulus. Uh, this is not involving any adhesions this time. The mesentery has gotten way too loose, or maybe the person was born without mesentery and the intestines tangled up on each other. Some other, other causes. Uh, stricture can occur. Uh, a tissue buildup within the lumen can cause a beaver dam. So this is uh, Crohn's disease can do this. Chemotherapy, radiation therapy can do this. Ischemia, inflammation can do this. Bottom line, almost think of it like atherosclerosis. You know how the plaque builds up in the arteries? and it narrows the lumen. Same kind of de deal here. We get a, a, a narrowing of the lumen because of usually scar tissue or inflammation. Uh, gallstone ileus, we'll take a look at that, but that can do it as well. Uh, these are not, this one's not so common, but it does happen. Patients with gallstones, they can, they can clog up the neck of the gallbladder and a hole can start to develop between out of the gallbladder and a hole can burrow right into adjacent intestine and the gallstones can spill out into the small bowel and they roll down the small bowel, get stuck in the distal ileum at that ileocecal valve and they can build up and they can literally cause a blockage that way. <clears throat> That's called gallstone ileus. Lots of stars here, I do like that one. So that little tunnel is called a fistula. Fistula. I think I, sorry about that. I think I forgot to turn on my laser pointer. Some other causes. So you can, just like the esophagus, you can get external tumors pushing into the wall of the intestine and compressing it that way. So that's external compression. Tumors, uh, large lymph nodes from Oh, from Hodgkin's disease could do it, abscesses, hematomas, etc. But the key is it's an external compression force. Foreign bodies of the intestine can do it if from swallowing crazy things like Legos, uh, quarters, things like that can physically block. But that's still a mechanical obstruction. There, with regard to severity, there's two types of block. There's a partial block. And a complete block, just like it says, the intestine and lumen is not completely blocked off. It's partially blocked off. And in this one, there's a complete block and nothing gets through. A big time problem with symptoms on this one. This can have a lot of symptoms as well, but the more blockage that there is, the more serious the problem typically. What's the sequelae? Who cares about a block? Well, for one, the patient... Uh, the as the fecal material starts to build up, it starts to it starts to set off stretch receptors, and the patient starts to feel pain. Also, downstream from that intestine, remember we talked about how important it is for the intestine to reabsorb salt and water, <clears throat> in particular. So you become very dehydrated. We'll look at some of the lab values from that, and if you become dehydrated. You, your blood can start to get really thick and kind of go into a hypovolemic state. Uh, malnutrition, if it goes on long enough. Uh, intestinal ischemia, if the blood vessels get compressed, either from the poop building up on the inside and compressing the vessels on the inside, or just from the tumor on the outside pressing in, whatever it is, if blood vessels start getting compressed, the affected tendon can die. 
uh, and that's not a good thing. Here's just a little anatomy uh, where we have uh, an intestine right here. We're, we're kind of telescoping out the pieces, like the mucosal layer here. You guys know this. I'm not going to go into this again, but our box plexus. Um, the Meissner's plexus is down deep here. And important to understand, here's the mesentery, right? This is what anchors the intestine to the posterior abdominal wall. We saw that in gross two lab a lot. But it's important to understand how these how these blood vessels and veins work. This cartoon doesn't show the vein, but these veins and arteries and nerves and lymphs, not even drawn in here, go in all these different layers. So there's the lymph vessels right there. So if this thing starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen to these blood vessels? They're going to start getting squished uh, against this outer muscular layer here. And that's not a good thing, right? If these get squished, especially the, the veins, then you're going to get a buildup and you're going to get ischemia and all these cells need to stay alive and they'll start to die. you start to get ischemia, so it's not a good thing. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and everything I just said, the veins are usually the first ones to get compressed. Remember, veins are flimsy. They're not, they don't really have much of a uh, tunica media layer. There's not a lot of muscle in there. If they get compressed, blood can't drain out from the intestinal wall. And edema occurs. The interstitium starts getting flooded. And things start swelling, and pretty soon, like a compartment syndrome, it'll start compressing the arteries as well. So you get hypoxia. That equals cell death. Uh, the bacteria, just think of all the, the fecal material in here. Bacteria are running wild, and they're letting off gas, blowing this thing up. And they're, the bowel is backing up. The fecal material is swelling out and out and out, and these are getting compressed more and more and more, the bacteria can start eating their way through uh, the intestine, and they can eventually can eat a hole right through it. And now you're in trouble because you have peritonitis. Peritonitis is really, that's a medical emergency, and that could lead to septicemia, and that could lead to death really quickly. Uh, here is a young patient with a, a hernia that's occurred of the small bowel through, I think this was an indirect inguinal hernia, but there's the bowel, but you could see now they cut it open. It was right here is the the orifice of the hernia. You can't see it anymore, they cut it open to release it. But this was outside of the, of the abdominal wall. And why is it all purple? Because blood, no blood and oxygen has been getting in here, so this tissue is dead or it's very close to death. It has to be cut out. Um, so that's a great example of ischemia there. Uh, some authors classify the severity of obstruction by two simple terms. Simple hernia, or simple uh, versus strangulated obstruction. Uh, they are designated by the degree of blood vessel compression and tissue ischemia. So if it's a simple, a simple type of compression or obstruction, sorry, obstruction, then you have no ischemia, no tissue death. If it's strangulated, that's much more serious. That means ischemic tissue, that was an strangulated, uh, that was a hernia that was strangulated. We'll talk about, you can use those same terms for hernias as well, but that that strangulated hernia caused a severe mechanical obstruction. Okay, signs and symptoms. Lots of stars popping up. I like to test on this stuff. So bilious eminence definitely is going to be on your test. Bilious eminence. Uh, whenever the patient starts throwing up green stuff, that's bile. That's violent vomiting. Bile is coming right through the pyloric sphincter into the stomach through the lower esophageal sphincter, through the upper esophageal sphincter, and out of the mouth it comes. A very serious sign there. The bile can accumulate uh, and it can reflux into the stomach. Once it gets in the stomach, the stomach doesn't like it. It's very powerful. There's some powerful uh, proteolytic enzymes in that, <clears throat> that green stuff. 
uh, and it can inflame the stomach and cause nausea and reflex vomiting. It can also, in addition to throwing up, it just makes your stomach upset. So you can have dyspepsia. The type of abdominal pain or dyspepsia is different, though, than what we've described. It's described as a colicky type pain. Colicky means uh, the pain crescendos and decrescendos. So it gets intenser. Maybe the pain is 5 on a 10 scale. Then it's two minutes later, it's a 6, then a 7, then an 8, then a 9, and the patient's ready to go to the hospital. Then two minutes, it starts back into an 8, to a 7, to a 6. So that's a crescendo, decrescendo type pain. Here's a picture of uh, a newborn who threw up all over his blankets, and that, and that is a go. Cool, you take the baby to the hospital if you see that. That's bilious eminence. He's throwing up bile. Some more signs and symptoms, a lot of new terms maybe for some of you. Constipation versus obstipation. These patients will have that. Why? Because the, no poop can get through the intestine. It's blocked, right? Uh, no gas either. Nothing's getting through. Everything is blocked. So uh, obstinance is a complete, we'll see some official definitions in a little bit, but it's a complete blockage of any type of bowel movement. I think you're allowed to have one really difficult uh, bowel movement per week, and you can still have obstipation. Constipation is just it's really hard to go to the bathroom, but you're still having bowel movements. Dehydration, of course, we just talked about that. Uh, so all the anything downstream from the block doesn't absorb water. And so therefore, you're not getting water into your bloodstream and you're becoming dehydrated. I talked about that. Hypovolemia is dangerous. You can go into shock and die from that. Patients with a partial obstruction, we talked about that. They typically have constipation. The official definition is less than three bowel movements per week. A patient... And with complete bowel obstruction, we'll have obstipation. There's the official definition. No bowel movements uh, per week. Or maybe one, but it's severely difficult to get out. Now we're getting some serious findings here. So now we have low blood pressure from the hypovolemia. Now we have tachycardia. Why would you have tachycardia with low blood pressure? If you have low blood pressure, you're having trouble feeding the tissue. can't get oxygen, so you need to speed up the heart to make up for the low pressure. And that's what the tachycardia means, a rapid heartbeat. Hematoschesia, that's another one. Hematochesia. Hematochesia. Uh, that is bloody bowel movements. Uh, and that's not the black tarry stool. Um, that is fresh red blood in the uh, in the fecal material. Very dangerous sign. That means that a strangulation has occurred and a perforation has occurred, but it hasn't occurred outside. It's occurred into the lumen. And so the patient is leaking blood into his own intestine. And it's going downstream and coming out. Probably not as any poop. Maybe the first poop it'll come out with, but then you won't have any more fecal material, right? It'll just be that dripping of blood, which is a really bad sign. Now, the patient's stomach will be distended. This could be early on as the bacteria upstream from the block are having a field day, partying, reproducing, setting off tons of gas, and the stomach gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You percuss the abdomen, and you get a general timpani everywhere. Remember I said, although the normal percussion node is what of the stomach, of the abdomen? tympanic, but it's mixed with areas of dullness because you're running into fecal material. But these patients are like a drum. If you palpate deep, check all four quadrants, you might actually find a solid mass where the fecal material is building up just upstream from the obstruction. The, if peritoneal signs, or per, uh, peritoneal signs are there, that is a medical emergency. Um, so that's local tenderness to deep palpation. They might have real like they're doing a crunch. They're, they have muscle rigidity, uh, even though you have them totally relaxed. That's 
Uh, they could have rebound tenderness. We'll talk about that one in a second where you push in and let go real fast and it hurts like crazy. Uh, these are very, uh, to the emergency room signs, these peritoneal signs. Rebound tenderness, look at all the stars here, super high yield board question here. Uh, Bloomberg's uh, or Blumberg sign, Blumberg sign is an AKA for, some call it Bloomberg. Uh, Blumberg, I think is the official word for it. <clears throat> it's rebound tenderness, an AKA. It can often catch early peritonitis. And what you do is you just press your fingers slowly into the region of pain. And it might be a little discomfort, but the patient should be able to tolerate it. And then suddenly you pull your fingers out. And the peritoneum was stretched and then snapped back into place. Uh, if the intestine is irritated, that will cause a sharp increase in pain. That's a positive Blumberg's test. Positive rebound tenderness. Everything I said right there. Uh, the couple books, Kane and Orient, they both said this is cruel and unusual punishment. If someone has involuntary guarding called, quote, rigidity when you're doing deep palpation, there's no need to do this. You know that rebound tenderness will be positive. It's kind of overkill and mean to the patient. Here's an example. So let's say this patient maybe had appendicitis or something going on, or who knows? But he had a lot of pain right here. So you push your hand in slowly and then quickly release it. And if they have pain right there, you have a positive Blumberg's test or positive rebound tenderness. Okay, again, positive test indicates early peritonitis. It is a medical emergency. It needs They need an emergency surgical console. Should have even more stars. This is very important. Again, rigidity is a voluntary, or sorry, that's an involuntary, that should be. Sorry, typo there. Let me write, make a note of that and fix slide 29. Should be involuntary uh, contraction of the abdominal muscle. It is not a good thing. Guarding is a voluntary. They do it because they know it's going to hurt. You can get them to relax, but they don't want to. But rigidity is... You, you can't get them to relax. It's a reflex contraction to protect the inflamed peritoneum below. Uh, if guarding is positive, if you find guarding in a patient, it doubles the chances of having peritonitis. If rigidity is present, it quadruples the chance of peritonitis. That's from Bates. That's a board book, right? So that's a, that's a good source. This is all from Bates. What else can cause rigidity? And guarding appendicitis, of course, cholecystitis, which is an inflammation of the gallbladder. Perforated bowel is what we're talking about now. An intestinal obstruction that goes for a long time. The bugs can eat a hole in the intestine, and now you got a perforation. And that can cause peritonitis and therefore cause rebound tenderness. Lab findings, I like this slide a lot, lots of stars. Uh, early on, they, when you first get into the ER, maybe the labs will be normal, but with the passage of time, the patient becomes dehydrated. And as they become dehydrated, the kidney goes into action to fight that dehydration by conserving sodium. What does that mean, conserving sodium? That means it's going to suck more sodium back into the bloodstream than normal through the uh, through all the mechanisms, proximal convoluted tubules in particular, uh, but uh, even uh, everything, they can all, it sucks in more sodium. Who goes the opposite direction of sodium? Potassium, hydrogen ion. So therefore, what are the lab work going to be in someone with a small bowel obstruction? Well, they're going to have hypokalemia. So they'll have low levels of blood potassium levels. They have hypo Let's do this one. They'll have alkalosis, which means there's not a lot of hydrogen ion floating around. Uh, they have a, their pH has risen too much. They're basic. It's not good. They also have hypochloremia. We haven't talked about that one too much, uh, but it's important that salt, which is sodium chloride, get absorbed into the enterocytes, right? Because water follows follows the sodium in, but chloride, we need chloride too. And because no water is being absorbed in the downstream intestine, because nothing's getting through, you can't absorb chlorine either. I'm sorry, chloride. And therefore, you have hypo 
chloremia, which is just low blood chloride levels. You will, later in the disease, you are elevated, you could have an elevated white count because the bacteria is starting to get into the blood or get into the tissue and the body spots that bacteria and starts an inflammation process. Bad sign for strangulation. Plain abdominal films. There's some classical stuff here. You get these dilated loops of bowel where you can see all the hostrations. Remember, gross one, I made you learn hostrations. Now that's going to come into play. I'll show you in a second. You're going to also see air fluid levels. Uh, and there's not going to downstream, you're not going to see any gas because nothing gets getting through. So a paucity means not a lot or scarcity of colorectal gas. Why? Because everything's blocked upstream. Uh, the presence of free intra-abdominal air is really bad news. That means the only way air can get into the peritoneal cavity is through a perforation. That's a medical emergency. Okay, take a look at this while I take a sip of water. What's going on here in this patient? Well, you can see all the, you can see the intestines. That's never normal, right? So, as a matter of fact, we can see where the block is. Coming around like this, I don't see anything else, do you? Maybe one little patch of gas down here, and that's it. So, no colon gas, nothing. There always should be a little gas. So, we got a blockage right here, mechanical block. Okay, classic small bowel obstruction. The radiograph was supine, so the so the air rose right to, to the top uniformly. Everything I said already. Air in the biliary tree, especially in the gallbladder, should never be air in the gallbladder. Uh, that could be gallstone ileus. I described that already, where the gallbladder gets a hole in it and the hole burls right into the adjacent intestine. Now we have an abnormal uh, communication, which is not a good a good thing. The stones can go out into the intestine and accumulate down by the ileal ceco region and cause an obstruction that way. Take a look at this one. This is a thanks to Radiopedia for this one I found floating around. Give me a second. Well, you can read it too. It's so complicated I didn't quiz you with it. But uh, A to P. So uh, number one, there's the gallbladder. Gallbladder would be right in this region here. So here we have a pocket of air. You should never see bowel up that high, right? So that's a really bad sign. So there must be a perforation to let some type of gas into the to the gallbladder. Uh, number two, if we follow the all this abnormal air filling up the small bowel, if you follow it, it goes across the spine, you can actually see uh, the blockage right there. That's a whole bunch of fecal material uh, getting packed in there. Number three, of course, is the, um, that's not correct to call those hostrations are only in the large intestine, but they still look like segmentations there. Plica circularis, give it that look. Okay, there's the kind of poop ball, if you want to call it that. Okay, uh, gas, gas is distension, oh, that's the answer, I guess. Gas is distension uniformly distributed throughout the stomach. Uh, this is called ileus. Oh, I didn't talk about this. Um, so it's just, it's just a worse condition. If you have gas in all the intestines, in the stomach, in the colon, that's called ileus. And that's, or paralytic ileus. That's not a good thing. That means that none of the peristalsis is working in the stomach, small bowel, large bowel. So that's not a good thing. Let's talk about it. Paralytic ileus, adynamic ileus, or some AKAs, lots of stars. Uh, it can mimic a bowel obstruction. Well, it is an obstruction in a way. It's just a massive obstruction through the whole GI system. But there's no real, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a functional dis, uh, obstruction or non-mechanical obstruction. It just means that peristalsis has stopped and therefore nothing is getting pushed through the tubes and the food is just backing up. What are the causes? The most common cause is surgery. It's fact, it takes a while for your 
intestines and your GI system to wake up after a surgery. Trauma, you get stabbed or shot. Uh, it can cause all the intestines to just kind of shut off. Hypokalemia is the most common metabolic cause. Um, so hypokalemia, that's too low potassium. Kidneys are conserving sodium to combat hypovolemia and dehydration. They kick out potassium and hydrogen ion. You can get to a point where you, your uh, potassium levels drop. Uh, and if they drop low enough, that shuts off the entire GI system. Drugs, especially in our, our, our neck of the woods, opioids, uh, too many opioids or being on them too long. Some people don't have any trouble, but some people can get ileus from this. Peritonitis can do it. Uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm that ruptures and leaks blood. Uh, the blood stimulates the kind of shutting off of the enteric nervous system, it's thought. Take a look at this one. Here's a chronic pain patient. Now on top of, he's been getting Percocets from his pain management doctor. You've been treating him. And now he says, Doc, my stomach, I haven't pooped in days. You look at his stomach, it's all puffed up like crazy. You take an take a x-ray of him. What do you see? Look at this is crazy. This is all intestinal gas. Transverse colon is pushed way up here. This is a mess. Nothing's working. He, you refer him to the hospital right away. Some differential diagnoses that you think it's small bowel obstruction, but it's not. Mesenteric artery ischemia can do this thing. If a patient has really bad atherosclerosis, it can start to narrow these mesenteric arteries, superior or inferior arteries, and that causes downstream ischemia. Remember, there's the intestinal branches off the superior mesenteric artery, and you're going to start getting ischemia, and the intestines are going to start not working because they, they're they not getting enough oxygen to have peristalsis. Um, this can present as a colically abdominal pain, just like a mecha regular mechanical obstruction. Uh, but if you order an, an uh, if you, well, you wouldn't order an angiography, angiography first, uh, but if your other testing was normal, if a CT scan didn't demonstrate any intestinal blockage, then you better order an, angi an angiogram. Uh, just to make sure the mesenteric arteries uh, are, are okay. People with colonic obstruction, the same thing. We're not going to have time to talk about that, but you can get twisting and tumors pushing into the colon bad enough or polyps bad enough to cause obstruction. So those symptoms can match small bowel obstruction quite nicely. Uh, what's the treatment? Uh, time in Mother Nature. Uh, fluid resuscitation, if it's really bad, they need to get electrolytes in there to get sodium and, and water back in their blood to get rid of the hypovolemia and the dehydration. They don't eat anything, right? You don't want to contribute to the, uh, the beaver dam, the backup of fecal material. And then you just wait, watch them. <coughs> Excuse me again. Uh, examine the abdomen every four to six hours. That includes a, an imaging, uh, an x-ray. Make sure it doesn't get worse. If it doesn't fail to improve in a day or two on its own, you're going to have to go in there and surgically fix whatever's causing the blockage, which often means just cutting out that piece of small bowel and sewing the ends back together. Remember, we said the small bowel, you, you, you can live without 50% of the small bowel just fine. So you can certainly lose a little section of it without... Uh, any trouble. Strangulated obstruction, this is a medical emergency. Uh, you're going to need surgery if it's strangulated. We'll talk more about that. that but that means that blood vessels, the downstream ischemia is now starting to happen, uh, and it's not a good thing. Mortality, if the, if the intestine turns gangrenous, approaches about 30% if that operation is delayed before 36 hours. So very serious. Strangulation is serious. Uh, the post-operative mortality for a non-strangulated obstruction is pretty good. Uh, strangulated obstructions carry about an 8% mortality rate as long as you get the patient in there within 36 hours. That's still pretty big, though, isn't it? Spine surgery is about 1% or maybe even less than that. So 8%. It's almost 1 out of 10 could die from this. I mean, these instructions are, are you know, dangerous stuff. See, so that's why you can't miss these signs, these clinical signs. 
Okay, let's talk about adhesions now. Remember we said adhesions were the most common cause of small bowel mechanical obstruction. About 75% of the time, if you have a small bowel mechanical obstruction, the culprit is an adhesion. Usually means you've had surgery. Uh, the intra-abdominal bands, what are they? They're, they're bands of fibrous or scar tissue uh, that attach between the peritoneal regions, peritoneal serous membranes, and they can tangle everything up. Usually occurs secondary following some injury to the uh, either the parietal and or visceral uh, peritoneum. I say peritoneal, peritoneum, I say those reversibly, you can't... That, Medical school I went to said peritoneum, and I just that just flows off your tongue so nicely. But it's really peritoneal. Perito, um, peritoneum is really the official pronunciation. Uh, peritoneum can heal, but sometimes it goes too far. Fibroblasts get into the area and go crazy and can't get rid of it then. We'll talk about it here in a second. And these adhesions will get tangled up and can twist the intestines and colon upon each other. Then you got yourself a mechanical blockage. These adhesions typically run between adjacent intestines, between the intestines and the abdominal wall where the surgery was done, uh, or between the wound, specifically between the, the wound and the intestines. They can be to the liver too. They can be to organs. It doesn't have to be that, but it's usually intestine to intestine. Here's a nice cartoon uh, of a small bowel, and you can see it's been looped up and a bunch of adhesions. <coughs> Here's a real one. There's a loop of small bowel. And here, that's not supposed to be there. That is an adhesion. They Now, just because you have adhesions, if you've had surgery, you probably have adhesions. But usually, they don't cause any trouble at all. Uh, only about 12% of them start to cause some abdominal pain, some discomfort. 3% uh, of them end up having surgery. Uh, so most of the time, 85% of the time or so, uh, you're not going to have any trouble with them. What causes them? They are not 100% sure, but we have some pretty good ideas. Uh, the surgical procedure, we'll look at this section here, this question more in a minute. Uh, but the bottom line at this stage is the peritoneum has been damaged or cut probably through an injury, an operation, or infection. And the peritoneum, that, that serosal membrane can repair itself much faster than a wound on the top of your skin. Uh, super fast. But sometimes that process goes amok and the fibroblasts that lay down the scar tissue they go unchecked and they lay down too much scar tissue and you get this long type of adhesion. And that's what it is. There are congenital type adhesions that can come from a persistent vitiline duct. And I don't know if we're going to talk that. If we are, it'll be next week. Uh, but I think that should have been covered in embryology. Uh, what is about the surgery that actually causes them? They've been studying this, and they're not 100% sure. They're very common after surgery. But it's any time the peritoneum gets damaged, uh, they can occur. If the omentum gets damaged as well, omentum is another type of, there are folds or fourfolds of uh, peritoneum, the greater omentum. Um, so if that's damaged, that can make things worse. So uh, exposure to, if you nick the intestine and some of the, Intestinal comments leak out or contents leak out. That can do it. That can that increases the chances for the development. Uh, the glove dusting powder, surgical gauze, sutures, lamps that heat uh, can overheat the region. Overheating of by surgical lamps. They're not heating lamps, but they're just surgical lamps. So you can see they can heat up the tissue. Uh, and some people just have a genetic propensity to form these things. The depressed fibrolytic response. We'll look at that in a minute. That's what that's what keeps those fibroblasts and the collagen in check. Fun fact: surgery to the pelvic region or lower abdomen has a much higher rate of developing adhesions than than surgeries higher up. Cholecystectomy is typically not very risky. That's considered 
too high up. It's like way down low in those lower quadrants. Pelvic hegens don't typically result in severe strangulation, even though they're more common. The ones higher up when they occur tend to strangulate more. Uh, greater momentum, not disturbed. Uh, they're, they're not sure why this, why they don't strangulate. That's th maybe because lower down the greater momentum is not down that low. <coughs> Pathophysiology, while the peritoneum and other intra-abdominal tissue are damaged, or when they're damaged, the body tries to repair them. Yeah, just like you get a cut on your skin, if you cut through the peritoneum, body's going to speed that healed real shut. Uh, but in, but cells with the inflammation repair process, when they get in there, they release cytokines and growth factors, which among other things call in macrophages to the area. Macrophages send signals and call in mesothelial cells from the deep connective tissue, which lies underneath the serosa layer. Uh, these mesothelial lay, uh, cells then lay down new peritoneal tissue. They re-epithelialize the tissue. In other words, they fix, they can rebuild a peritoneum really quickly. But fibrin gets laid down too. It's like a spider web. And then if the fibrin stays there too long, fibroblasts come in uh, to the spider web and they secrete, they secrete uh, different types of collagen and uh, tropocollagen and elastic fibers. And that's basically a scar tissue. So you get an excess of scar tissue buildup. Now normally, in most of us, that's good because you've got to fix the hole. But that needs to be shut off and the fibroblasts need to be <clears throat> killed. And that's the process of fibrinolysis. And some people don't, their fibrinolysis gets delayed uh, or it doesn't work good, whether it be genetic or, or the result of something we don't exactly know. But if fibrinolysis gets turned off, fibroblasts run amok and they make too much scar tissue and you can't get rid of it. And that excess scar tissue is the adhesions. So it's believed that the problem lies with dysfunctional fibrolytic activity. Timing. Uh, symptoms of the abdominal pain following these adhesions, if you're going to have adhesions, it's probably going to show up within one year of the surgery. Uh, this is not always the case. You can have adhesions develop years after the surgery, but usually it's going to be with one within a year. Okay, let's talk about uh, malrotation now. It's kind of a different subject. During, we'll remember from our embryology classes that when intestines develop, they have to rotate into position, and then they attach themselves to the posterior abdominal wall via the mesentery. So they rotate, and then a mesentery has to grow. So you can get problems with that. Here's just a picture of a real intestine during surgery, and you can see the mesentery is all this white stuff. Remember, the veins and arteries run, uh, and fat can be in here as well. This mesentery or intestinal, so it's this mesentery that normally prevents any intestinal malrotation. It anchors the intestine to the posterior abdominal wall, keeps it on a leash, so to speak, so it can't get too wild. Um, here's a picture where they cut the mesentery, they took all the intestines out. Here's the posterior abdominal wall, and they cut this. This is all the root of the mesentery, uh, and that goes and attaches to all of the intestines holds it down so it can't get too wild. Same thing with the intestines. You remember what holds the intestines down? Mesocolon. So we have transverse mesocolon and sigmoid mesocolon, uh, which you can actually see right here. Sigmoid mesocolon. And that holds things in place. Why is there no ascending and descending mesocolon? Because those are extra peritoneal. You have to be in the peritoneum to have any type of this hold down tissue. Malrotation means that one of two things. It means that the intestine failed to properly rotate during embryogenesis and therefore the mesentery never formed. Or they did properly rotate uh, but they failed to fixate 
to the posterior abdominal wall, which probably means something went wrong with the mesentery. Either it didn't attach right to the tendons, or it didn't attach right to the tendons, or to the intestines, uh, or it just was mutated in some way. Malrotation usually occurs because the mesentery either fails to develop or it fails to anchor firmly. So it's a problem with the darn mesentery. In either case, the intestines can over-rotate, get tangled up. Now you've got yourself a mechanical obstruction. Uh, this is this mesentery failure rotation. If that results in an obstruction, that's called a mid-gut volvulus is another word for that. A mid-gut volvulus. <clears throat> Here's an example uh, where these intestines were way too loose and they started twisting around the cecum and now you got yourself a big mess. Can you imagine trying to get food through that mess? It's not going to be very easy. It is a major life-threatening condition. And we can just go kind of ditto everything we talked about. Obstruction is about the same. It's about the same symptoms. It tends to be a little more severe because the entanglement can be massive with this. Uh, requires immediate surgery. They don't even play around if this has happened. It's just too much tangling. Uh, happens, symptomatic ones are found in about 2% of the population. So this is not like Marfan syndrome. It's definitely out there. Because the majority of them stay asymptomatic, though, the true prevalence will never be known. 50% of these malrotations become clinically significant within the first month of life. So this is more of a problem with babies. 90% are discovered by one year. So this is more of a little kid's problem. Clinical signs are exactly like intestinal obstruction. Bilious eminence, again, is a key sign. Uh, a recent study of infants coming into the ER with bilious eminence, what was the final diagnosis? 6% of them had malrotation. Uh, they had obstruction or mid-gut volvulus, which is just mechanical obstruction. 32% of them had obstetrical obstruction uh, from other type of causes, whether it was tumor or a uh, scar tissue entangled them, adhesions entangled them, other causes. Bilious eminence, again, not a great sign. Clinical signs are the same uh, as obstruction. Uh, so other signs of volvulus, same as small bowel obstruction. So the stomach, stomach will be all puffy from all the bacteria running wild, producing gas. It'll be tympanic everywhere. Abdominal pain, which could be colicky, crescendo, decrescendo in intensity. Constipation, obstipation, dehydration, and all its phenomena or sequelae. Tachycardia, hypovolemia, alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypochloremia. Lots of stars. I expect you guys to know this clinical stuff good. Small bowel hernias. Now, you might want to jump right away if you're completely... Well, I guess I'm going to take that back. We're going to talk about small bowel hernias just more in regard to mechanical obstruction. Then we're going to get into hernias. Uh, I'm going to have a tape. I'm going to do an anatomy review of the of the anterior abdominal wall in the inguinal region, which a lot of you need. You have boards coming up in January, so it'll be great review for you. Probably not going to test too heavy on it, but uh, well, it's, um, in fact, I think I have one up on YouTube right now in the anterior abdominal wall. But So let's just keep going with this. Uh, this occurs when the small bowel herniates through a defect or weakness in the abdominal cavity. So you have a hole in your rectus sheath, let's say, and your intestinal comments, or contents can herniate right through. That's basically what we're saying. About 10% of all mechanical small bowel obstructions are secondary to small bowel, or secondary uh, to defects in the anterior abdominal wall. 30% of these require surgery. So these have a high tendency to incarcerate. Hernia parts, so this is important stuff. The abdominal wall hernia has two main parts. It has an orifice, or that's a fancy way to say a hole or defect in the wall. That's where the intestinal contents squirt out. And then the stuff that is squirted out, and it's now outside of the hole, 
That's called the hernia sac. Got a nice picture coming up in a second. I like this. Good for your anatomy, too. You can you know, read that anterior abdominal wall anatomy. <clears throat> but what are the contents of the hernia sac? That's a great board question. Well, skin. We'll see not all the time in newborns. We'll, we'll talk about some uh, umbilical hernias where they don't even have skin. But from adults, and most of the time, there's skin, subcutaneous tissue. Then you're missing the muscle. That's where the hole is. And you're missing the fascia underneath that, which is the transversalis fascia. But then you have the next layer down, the preperitoneal fat or extraperitoneal fascia. Um, then you have parietal peritoneum, greater omentum, visceral peritoneum, and intestinal wall. That's basically the intestine. Here's a pretty good picture. It's not perfectly complete, but here's the guy's belly. Uh, and here's a, the muscle. You can see there's a defect in the muscle. And it's let the intestine push through. And now the intestine has done a loop out here. And so the orifice is this. That's the hole that allows the intestine to escape. The hernia sac is everything that's outside. And now we can see the contents. There's the skin. Uh, there is the parietal peritoneum, purple there. Uh, the red would be the visceral peritoneum. And then we have the intestine itself. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me, excuse me. Blood and moments done. General types. Uh, so you can have an external versus an internal hernia. By far the most common we're going to focus on are the external hernias. They're the ones where the sac is protruding through the abdominal wall. By far the most common. Epigastric hernia is an example. There's all sorts of them. Internal hernias, though. So the intestines can move, uh, can herniate within the peritoneal cavity. One common one is uh, where intestine can move through the foramen of Winslow into the lesser sac. Remember the lesser sac? Uh, right underneath the, the lesser omentum. Remember there's that lesser sac. You can put your hands through the foramen of Winslow. Intestines can herniate through that, and we'll look at that. You can also have them herniate backwards to where the kidneys, remember kidneys are retroperitoneal, and you can have holes in the peritoneum in the back, and they can herniate out that way as well. So it's not always external, but we're going to focus on external hernias. Here's some little anatomy here. The belly button would be up here. Here's the spine. Here's the, the greater the greater sac or the peritoneal cavity itself. Remember the pancreas is is retroperitoneal. It's it's outside of the peritoneum. I think the actually the tail of it, if I remember right, goes into it a bit, but this is close enough. So you can get a hernia come right in right out here to the retroperitoneal space here. Okay, there's the foramen of Winslow. There's your stomach. Remember the lesser curvature there's a membrane. Here's the hepato, hepatoduodenal, hepatoduodenal ligament, which is part of the lesser omentum. And then we have the gastrohepatal ligament, lesser curvature, making up. This is the lesser omentum here. And there's a little cave under here. You can stick your fingers under here, uh, and you can wiggle them around. And now you're in the lesser sac. Everything else out here, greater sac. So intestine, intestines can herniate through the foramen of Winslow. I think it's called the, epi is it the epiploic foramen as well? There's a bunch of AKAs for that. Foramen of Winslow is the more common one. But there you, there you have an internal hernia. Some more terminology. And we have a reducible hernia. That means that you've went in and you can actually push the hernia. It's poking out through your anterior abdominal wall. You can actually push it and it goes back in. Usually you usually have to inject a little lidocaine around the area because it hurts, but surgeons might be able to push it back in. An incarcerated hernia means they tried to push it in, and it can't. It's stuck. Very dangerous because it can become ischemic really fast. These people are going to have to have surgery. Strangulation means the incarcerated hernia, it's actually compromised the blood supply and the tissue of the intestine that's tra trapped in the hernia sac is dying. 
So not a good thing. Carcerated hernia, everything I just said, neck orifice obstructs the venous flow, but more specifically, blood backs up. And as the blood backs up in the intestinal wall, the intestine expands, and now it's really stuck because it, there's no chance of it getting through uh, the hole. Um, so without treatment, or that's called an incarcerated hernia, once it gets stuck. Without treatment, the incarcerated hernias can easily become strangulated. And that's a medical emergency that can lead to peritonitis, septicemia, and death. Okay, this is the last one, I think. Richter's hernia. This is a partial hernia. Um, so it's a nipped hernia, pinched hernia, partial enteral seal. It's been called Richter's hernia. And this means only part of the bowel is through the defect and part of it's not. It's like a halfway hernia. Best way to do is look at a picture. So here's the intestine. And here a piece of the intestine has started to balloon out, almost like an aneurysm, through the, the orifice, which would be the circle right here. That's a classic Richter's hernia. They can still strangulate. This tissue can get uh, become engorged. Uh, the blood, think of blood vessels draining this region. They can become compressed, and the blood backs up and makes this bigger, and then the hole gets tighter, and it can strangulate. These Richter hernias are typically uh, the type of hernias, uh, typically called femoral hernias, or obturator hernias are, we'll talk about these, uh, but these are typically Richter type hernias. And that leads us to the general topic of hernias, uh, which are highly aboard. You're going to see patients with these things, umbilical hernias, inguinal hernias, obturator femoral hernias, uh, linea alba hernias. There's a bunch of them that happen there. So this is the point, before we dig into this, you need to do a review of anatomy so you understand uh, the, the inguinal triangle. That's You need to know that to know the difference between a uh, between the different um, inguinal hernias, the direct versus indirect inguinal hernias. So let's go to that YouTube video now uh, and we will review anatomy on that area.